Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Brad Wilson with the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions here at Princeton. Uh, welcome to the second of three Charles E. Test lectures being presented by our friend Roger Scruton, who's visiting from England uh, and Scotland. Roger uh, is a visiting professor of philosophy at St. Andrews University and the University of Oxford. He's also a senior fellow uh, at the Ethics and Public Policy Center in Washington, D.C. Um, Yesterday, Professor George gave uh, uh, his bio to those of you who were here, uh, and so you heard a lot about Roger's work. Uh, I went on Wikipedia this afternoon uh, and just to count the number of books that might be listed there, and sure enough, they don't have all of them. They only have 39 nonfiction works, five fiction works, two operas, and a TV show on why beauty matters. Uh, his, his writings uh, really do range widely, uh, anything from a short history of modern philosophy to sexual desire, a moral philosophy of the erotic, to, in 2009, I drink, therefore I am, a philosopher's <laughs> guide to wine. Uh, yesterday, uh, we heard uh, from Professor Scruton, um, his thoughts on human nature. Today, he turns his mind to uh, human rights, and then on Thursday afternoon, here at 4.30, he'll address human duties. I give you Roger Scruton. Thank you very much, Brad, Thanks for that, those kind words. It's, um, hang on, you two, have you gone away with my paper you have. <laughs> so um, yesterday I talked in a very general way about human nature, arguing that we human beings are animals like other animals. We belong to the order of nature and are governed by the same causal laws as the rest of reality. Uh, but over the physical reality we lay a, a veil of appearance, of which we are the authors, and in doing so superimpose a many-layered order on things through which we relate to each other and relate to the world. And I gave some uh, examples of this and described the various levels in which the human, uh, the human world is constructed. So uh, briefly what I said was that the order of reality over the order of reality is laid the veneer of appearance. But appearances are also real. And I think one of the most important things to remember in, uh, in human life is that we are creatures who live in the world of appearance and find our satisfaction there. It's how, thi it's how things seem that really matters to us. Of course, how things are is important too, but it's the seeming which is the uh, final test of the value of things. And uh, I argued yesterday that the I to you relation is the foundation of the moral life, the relation in which we address each other and uh, make ourselves accountable to each other as self-conscious and uh, answerable beings. But this uh, I you relation also creates a boundary between self and other. I can't relate to you uh, in this manner if there isn't, in some sense, a, a conception of, my, of the difference that separates us, of my, me being one thing, you being another, and there being ways of crossing that boundary and perhaps ways of reinforcing it against each other when we don't want it to be crossed. Uh, without the boundary, we just uh, would coalesce into one seamless first-person plural. And that, of course, is a possibility, and I think it was raised in the questions yesterday, but it isn't the, the condition in which we, as post-Enlightenment individualists, find ourselves. And I'm really talking about our condition here and now. So we, we, have, we need to navigate this boundary to uh, know when it is possible to cross it and by what means. Uh, and I, I think we do this by using a distinct form of, of human thought, which I call the, the calculus of rights uh, and duties. 
that we assign rights to each other, and in response to those rights also accumulate duties. Uh, and this calculus is natural to us, though it describes nothing in the order of nature. Right? That there is no, no such thing in physical reality as a right or a duty, but there is such a thing in the world as a right and, a, as a right and duty, and that is something that we create through our interactions. Right? And there are various a priori principles that it seems to me govern this calculus of rights and duties, the, the principles which we adhere to in order to make ourselves understood and to be able to exchange the kind of arguments that we need to exchange if we are to live uh, through consent and agreement rather than through force and opposition. So these are principles that are presupposed in the normal I to you dialogue that all of us are engaged in uh, at some point of the day and perhaps more often engaged in than not. Uh, and I'm not going to give you all of these principles, so I don't really have a, a, a vision of, how, of the totality of them, but just, a few, just three. The principle of reciprocity. That those who claim rights must also confer them. If you are in the business of uh, claiming that you have a right to something against somebody else, or a right that he must respect, or whatever, then you are also obliged to confer on him uh, the, uh, whatever rights are appropriate to his uh, circumstances. You, you're dealing in rights, and you're con you have to acquiesce in the idea that he too is a right owner. Then the principle of equality Everybody knows that equality is a controversial concept, that um, people fight over what it means, uh, um, in what respect human beings are all equal to each other, if any respect, and we know that, uh, that there are many respects in which we have to accept that they're not equal. But uh, I think there is a fundamental idea underlying all moral argument and all legal argument too, uh, which is that each is to count for one. Each person counts for one in, this in, in whatever discussion we engage in, in uh, allocating rights, and not for more than one or less than one. Uh, and perhaps we could add to that that uh, the default position, if we don't know what rights pe any particular person has or in, in any dispute, uh, then the default position is that we assume equal rights and, w and argue from there. Then we have to look at the history of the situation to see the extent to which People have deviated from that original equality. Then there is the very famous principle of natural law that agreements are to be honoured. It's so famous that it has a, uh, it's got transcribed into Latin. Um, this was defended by, by Grotius in his uh, book on the law of war and peace, in which he laid down for the, probably for the first time, what he thought to be operative principles of international law, and this one being the most important. Agreements are worth nothing if, we can't, if, if they're not honoured, and accepting this principle is a precondition of making a sincere agreement. And we all accept this in promising, don't we, that uh, a promise is uh, a, a, a recognition that you are obliged to do something, and you're obliged to the person to whom you give that promise. Now, I, I see Kant's moral philosophy as a kind of extrapolation of these, kind, this, these principles and similar principles, but one which tries to give no special position to the second person case. I've been making the second person case extremely important, what we, what we are for each other and how we respond to, the, to each other when we address each other as you. Um, but Kant wants to give a, a much more abstract picture uh, with uh, these metaphysical principles which are supposed to be universally valid and don't actually mention uh, any particular person or any particular relation between people. And, it, you know, his moral philosophy is very persuasive partly because you can derive from it something like these a priori principles of the ITU dialogue. But I believe that the source of morality is not transcendental, as Kant thought it was, but imminent. The source of morality is you. You, namely the person whom I encounter and who calls me to account. Moral reasoning is essentially addressed to the other, 
and even when the other is myself. If I'm deliberating on something, saying, is this the right thing to do? Was I right to do that? Am I to blame? And so on. I'm looking at myself uh, as though I were another. I'm looking on myself uh, from outside, engaging in the kind of dialogue I would engage with uh, in with another. So <clears throat> that f calculus of rights and duties, I think we're all very familiar with it. Uh, maybe uh, it, it's not entirely laid out before your, in your thinking before your mind yet, but it, I hope to unravel it a little bit as I go along. It, it's presupposed in all our free dealings even when we don't explicitly invoke it, when we uh, uh, apologise, when we move aside to let someone who's in a hurry go through and so on, we're, we're in the business of not treading on his rights or not, um, or not intruding on the sphere in which his uh, uh, sovereignty exercises itself. And, and this is quite important in a society like ours which depends largely on, on market transactions because all markets presuppose an assignment of rights. If I, if I exchange uh, my, uh, say, my, my armchair with your, uh, with your cooker, or sell you my armchair for, uh, for a certain sum, it is assumed that I have a, a right of property in this thing, in this armchair, and you have a right of property in the, in the cooker. It's only on the assumption that people have rights in things and are able to exercise those rights, that they can then freely dispose of them, freely relinquish those rights in exchange for somebody else relinquishing uh, their rights in whatever it is that they possess. And I, I think that, that should be fairly obvious, but it, it does mean that market economies depend upon a background moral theory. A, a moral, not a moral theory perhaps, but a, a moral reality, namely that people relate to each other in this way through the calculus of rights and duties. And it could very well be that it's only in certain circumstances where, in which uh, certain virtues are cultivated that people do relate to each other in that way. So that there is a, there are, and I think this is true, definite moral presuppositions of a market economy. A market economy won't generate morality because it depends upon it. <clears throat> and this was a point that was made very clear by Adam Smith in his theory of the moral sentiments and also the wealth of nations, and, and has, alas, been forgotten over the years, although people become aware of it every now and then when there's some uh, appalling stock market crash. But uh, anyway, well, if we're using this calculus, it gives us a, a handle on what to do when things go wrong. When things go wrong, somebody injures another or, or, uh, or in some way trespasses on his, uh, his rights, we impute the wrong to someone. We hold him to account for it and make a claim against him. So there, there are concepts belonging to this calculus which uh, have to do with imputation. This is a, a Roman law concept which um, has survived in all legal systems, the idea that, that uh, damage can be imputed to the person who causes it in some way or another. Uh, and we, um, we have worked out over the centuries through uh, many cases in courts of law and all the arguments between us in, uh, from the playground through to the marriage bed, uh, um, the uh, uh, logic of excuses, the excuses that will enable us to get away uh, with doing something wrong without it being imputed to us. And that is an inc incredibly important and delicate part of this calculus, uh, which has been beautifully discussed by John J. L. Austin in his paper, A Plea for Excuses. I don't want to go into it, but just to remind you that much of the discussion in a court of law is about this matter of imputation or answerability. Who, who actually does bear the liability for what was done? And in a court of law and, and, in, and in our daily dealings, we're always, when things go wrong, looking for a remedy. The, the, the natural condition of uh, human relations is that we think that things have been disturbed from an equ equilibrium and we want to restore that equ equilibrium. Uh, and that is something which uh, certainly the common law takes as given. That is the premise from which the civil actions in a common law begin. That, that, that equilibrium must be restored. And I want to say something about common law justice in this respect. 
And the common law, I, I mean, just for those of you who haven't uh, thought about legal ideas, common law just means the system of law that developed in uh, England uh, during the Middle Ages, out, uh, developed out of Anglo-Saxon law with in, inputs from uh, ecclesiastical and Roman law, but in which the law emerges from the uh, judgments in individual cases. In the individual case, the judge tries to provide a remedy to rectify the wrong, and there is a, 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 implicitly a reason for him doing this, a ratio decidendi, the reason on, on which the, the case was decided. But uh, people may not may, may dis dispute that they know the reason, but they know even when they think the case was decided rightly. So um, the, the law, as it were, builds up from below through individual decisions, which are then generalized by higher courts until the, the system of law emerges, uh, as it were, um, precipitated out from the uh, particular conflicts. That is, the, in many ways, the opposite of the continental approach to law, in particular the Roman, um, Roman law and, uh, and Napoleonic law approach, which regards law as laid down by a sovereign legislature and then applied. Uh, you deduce the answer to the individual case. So it, it, it starts at the top and then it's applied at the bottom. Uh, uh, and, uh, of course, there are... These could perhaps lead to the same result, but they're bound to be tensions between them. It's one of the reasons why there is this huge tension in Europe between the, the European Union and Britain, you know, uh, the, 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 namely the, the logical incompatibility of our legal systems, uh, which, are, which we don't feel, of course, uh, when it comes to America, because your system derives from ours and, and also has all the common law basis. Right. As many people have pointed out, uh, there are hard cases in law where the existing law doesn't give you a, a, an answer to what the, the uh, uh, an answer to the individual problem. And Ronald Dworkin, in a couple of very uh, classic papers, hard cases and, ta uh, and taking rights seriously. Uh, describes the, um, the, some of these cases and what he thinks to be the moral to be drawn from them. <clears throat> I myself don't think that he drew the right moral from, from them, and I want to say a few things uh, of my own about a particular hard case, which is the case of Rylands and Fletcher of 1865, a very well-known case in English law, uh, which introduced uh, perhaps the most important... Uh, environmental provision that are, uh, to date that our uh, legal system had arrived at. The, the defendant was a, a mill owner who had constructed a reservoir on his land and the water burst through old mine shafts into the mines of the plaintiff, which were thereby flooded and put out of use. And no similar case had come before the courts because this was the new, uh, the new economy, the Industrial Revolution economy, in which everything was huge, uh, threatening and uncontrolled. Uh, and uh, the court of... Uh, so the, there's a real question of who, who had the right to what and who was liable. And the court of Exchequer Chamber gave judgment in the following words of Mr Justice Blackburn. We think that the true rule of law is that the person who for his own purposes brings on his lands and collects and keeps there anything likely to do mischief if it escapes must keep it in at his peril. And if he does not do so, is prima facie answerable for all the damage which is the natural consequence of its escape. And this rule, the judge said, uh, seems on principle just. But until Rylands uh, and Fletcher, no such rule had ever been formulated. The facts of the case arose in this new industrial context, which had never been predicted, uh, but which was, which was generally generating serious public anxiety about all the poisons accumulating everywhere. Um, so did Mr Justice Blackman merely invent the rule? Uh, if he did, then Mr Rylands was penalised by an act of retroactive legislation. In other words, by the invention of a law of which he could have had no prior knowledge. Uh, and, and that would be a flagrant injustice. But you have to consider the judge's words. He says, we think that the true rule of law is... In other words, in his own eyes, 
He was not inventing the rule, but discovering it. And that was the opinion of the House of Lords in upholding the judgment. So um, there is the big question about hard cases. Does the, just, ju does the judge make or discover the law? Uh, and some people dismiss common law as judge-made law, saying that law ought to be made by a legislature. Uh, whereas Mr. Justice Blackburn himself didn't think he was making the law. He thought that he was, uh, as it were, discovering what was, had been implied in, not only in the existing law, but in the, the, the conduct of the people involved, of plaintiff and, uh, plaintiff and defendant. Uh, there may be a third possibility, um, you know, some, some things that, uh, that uh, are not clearly made are not clearly discovered either, you know, like a mathematical proof, uh, or a, a proof in some advanced uh, area of mathematics that seems to have no application, you know, somebody gives you a, a proof as to, as to how many uh, n-dimensional men can, can um, uh, manipulate an n plus one dimension or dimensional piano through an n minus one dimensional corridor. <laughs> you know, you might say, oh, is that a, has he invented that or has he discovered the truth? You know, it's, it it's a, looks like something in another third realm. But, it, but these are real problems, legal problems, they're not like that. Uh, and <clears throat> it creates a, uh, uh, raises a huge question as to what we're doing in assigning rights in a case like this. You know, we're a, a, a right in the, uh, Mr. Ryland's part to, to um, receive compensation. And this is another statement that, of Dawkins. He describes rights as trumps. Uh, and I think uh, this is a very interesting way of describing it. A, a right is something which, um, once, once you've been accorded it by a, a court of law, it overrides any arguments to the contrary. Many of our conflicts are conflicts of interest. You, know, uh, you, you have an interest in, in obtaining some piece of property next to yours. I have an interest also in, in retaining it. And uh, we could, if all, all we had was just two conflicting interests, we might be able to come to a compromise about it. But if the court says that you have a right and I have merely an interest, then you take precedence. That trumps my interest. And this is the general uh, problem in all legal decisions of this kind, that they are, in effect, zero-sum decisions. The person who who's gets the... Um, who's given judgment, if judgment in favour of him, is the person who takes away everything uh, and the other is left with nothing. Uh, and zero-sum solutions to, to human conflicts are, in general, a rather bad thing because they produce the next conflict. Uh, and this is um, something which is quite clear from, from uh, Arist the Aristia of Aeschylus, in which all the conflicts are zero-sum conflicts. Uh, one person is right uh, 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 and the other person wrong, uh, and, and uh, the, the rights of one person are affirmed, uh, and then vengeance is taken uh, for that, until finally a compromise is imposed by Athena at the end. Most of us r realize that human societies can't exist as zero-sum devices. They've got to have some procedure for compromise solutions. Anyway, the, 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 that case illustrates the way in which common law rights are precipitated out from the solutions to specific conflicts. A and it shows, I think, that the reasoning involved is natural to us. It's natural, if you're uh, uh, considering a case like that, to think, well, who is liable? To whom can we impute this wrong? And if we can successfully Im impute it to Mr. Fletcher, then uh, uh, he has to take responsibility for that and try to rectify the situation of Mr. Rylands in order to restore equilibrium, to put him back, Mr. Rylands back, in the position that he would have been had this disaster not occurred. Uh, and that's what I mean by saying that the common law is a homeostatic system. It has this, it's, it's in the business of returning things to equilibrium when they depart from it, just as your body is. So this kind of reasoning is natural to us, but it doesn't mean that, 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 that the rights in question are natural rights. And this is where I want to get into a uh, difficult area of political thought. 
you know, we, we re it's natural to us to reason with this calculus of rights and duties, and the common law grew out of it, but the rights that are uh, presented to us by common law are not natural rights, they're rights that we have by virtue of our citizenship or whatever, by virtue of our membership of a particular community. We don't want to say that all human beings everywhere have them, or at least we, not for this reason anyway. So this brings us on to, to the question of natural rights. There's a, a long tradition in uh, political thinking associated, of course, with the Christian churches uh, and specifically with Thomism, which uh, believes that underlying every system of law, there is a natural law, a law that, that human reason alone suffices to reveal to us. We just have to think about things and, we, uh, uh, and we'll see what the, the underlying eternal law uh, recommends and that all laws laid down by human legislatures or human sovereigns have, uh, have the obligation to conform in some way to that natural law, uh, if they're to be valid. Now, that Locke really uh, pushed that aside in his um, f uh, famous discussion of these uh, uh, print, uh, uh, questions uh, and replaced the idea of natural law with that of natural rights, saying that that really that there are rights that we have in the state of nature and, and which belong to us purely by virtue of our nature as, as human beings. And it's those that must be respected if a system of law is to be legitimate. So he put this as a test of legitimacy, the, 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 the rights that we enjoy, enjoy by virtue of our human nature. Locke's theory or, or view of human nature was a very thin one, however, as, as is generally the case with empiricists, uh, and certainly not in any way uh, uh, corresponding to those uh, layers of, uh, of being that I tried to uh, refer to last time. So uh, in, in many ways, his, his, the natural rights that he picks out as uh, uh, integral to our human condition are without real f philosophical foundation. They float there in his works on political philosophy without any obvious reason why they're there. Uh, and uh, at a certain stage, Jeremy Bentham made the famous uh, observation that uh, the, the talk of natural rights is nonsense on stilts. What, it, what he meant was that, that rights only have meaning for us if we can enforce them. You only have a right to something really, in reality, if you can go before a court of law and say, give it to me. Uh, just to declare rights in the airy philosophical way that Locke had done is in no way to, to bestow them on people. And, and that's what uh, Bentham objected to, that, uh, that by doing this, uh, we're really speaking nonsense and we, because we're taking the law out of the conditions in which it, it, it should be applied. Well, um, so there's a huge controversy then, uh, there, and the controversy was a lot, had a lot to do with the French Revolution, which justified itself in terms of the um, natural rights of the human subject, uh, and um, then uh, proceeded immediately to cut off the heads of all those who disagreed with it, uh, which was, seemed to, rather to discredit the idea. But uh, the United States, meanwhile, there had been the United States, the Declaration of Independence by the American people, uh, in which there was an affirmation of very basic rights, the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And most people in this room, I'm sure, think that they do have those rights. <laughs> Meaning only that nobody else can take, nobody has the right to take them away. To take away your life is to, is to murder you, to take away your liberty is to imprison you, to take away your right to the pursuit of happiness is to control the way in which you go about uh, fulfilling your, yourself, the way in, in which you go about living. All those things are anathema to Americans and also to human beings as such. But these rights are, in, in a certain sense, negative. They're what some people call freedom rights or liberty rights. They, you honour these rights by doing nothing. You respect my right to life by just leaving me alone. Likewise, my right to liberty, my right to the pursuit of happiness. But when the United Nations Charter was drawn up after the Second World War, all kinds of other rights crept in. And here is Article 22, which only I've 
curtailed. Everyone, as a member of society, has the right to social security and is entitled to realization of the economic, social, and cultural rights indispensable for his dignity and the free development of his personality. Right? That's not, a, not granting freedoms to somebody, is it? It's granting an avenue to fulfillment uh, and also uh, suggesting that somebody's got to be providing for this, pride, providing for his social security and the economic, social, and cultural conditions which will enable him to be both to, to live in dignity and to develop his personality. Now, obviously, there's a lot of jargon in there, but it, it, most people know what it really means under, uh, underneath. Uh, and we seem to have crossed a barrier uh, from freedom rights, the rights which can be granted simply by leaving people alone, to what are sometimes called claim rights, rights which involve a claim on others to do something. Uh, you know, the claim on, on society or something to provide social security and all these economic and, economic and so, so on benefits. Well, um, the, these di distinction, the distinction here has been um, admirably discussed by the American jurist Hofeld in the, uh, the beginning of the 20th century, who argues that all these concepts like right, duty, and claim, and so on, and privilege, are connected logically, uh, and you can understand them by understanding the connections between them. And he describes a claim right as a directed duty. It's not really a right in the, sense, in the way in which a freedom right is. It's a duty di that is directed towards the person who has that claim. So it's a, a burden lying on others, in other words. Uh, and... Um, <clears throat> this has led, of course, if we can claim, include claim rights in our list of universal rights, it has led to the well-known problem of rights inflation. Uh, the universal freedom rights, uh, which are granted by, or claimed rather, by the Declaration of Independence, are designed to, to protect the individual against the state. You know, that was the, that was the um, uh, obviously the intention of the colonists in defying the crown, to say, look, there are certain things you can do to us, but you, there are certain things you can't do to us, certain respects in which you've got to leave us alone. Uh, and that means, uh, in particular, you can't take away our life or our liberty or our uh, right to pursue our own happiness in the way that we decide. But the universal claim rights that cracked into the United Nations Charter are really designed to empower the state on behalf of the individual. They're saying, you know, if you want to belong to this community of United Nations, then you, the, the, the state in question, whatever, the nation in question, must offer to your citizens these opportunities, these paths to fulfillment, which uh, actually require quite a positive intervention in the economic and social life of the, of the state. So uh, these are pulling in opposite directions, uh, and we feel that in particular now. The freedom rights uh, are, uh, uh, as it were, arguing for, for a limitation of state power, and the claim rights are wanting an, uh, an enhancement of state power, at least in certain areas. Uh, and, of course, this underlies the, the perennial con con conflict, which still exists in our societies, between the libertarian uh, and the socialist vision of what a human community is. Uh, we don't talk very much about libertarians uh, versus socialists now, because everything has had the sharp edges rubbed off it by uh, a whole century of futile discussion. But ne nevertheless, you know, sometimes people say liberal and conservative instead or whatever, uh, or conservative and liberal in this case. But uh, you get that we all know that underneath many of our social conflicts to get today, in particular conflicts over um, President Obama's health care legislation, there are these two uh, conflicting uh, tendencies. The, the tendency of, the, of the, those who wish to reduce state power for the benefit of individual freedom and uh, opportunity and, uh, and so on, and those want to increase state power in order to uh, offer privileges and advantage to those who would otherwise not enjoy them. 
uh, and uh, there is a real question as to how you could possibly resolve that conflict. Uh, and certainly an another question as to whether the concept of the a right is the right one to have fixed on in order to do so. And this is part of the problem that, that having expressed all this, these conflicts in terms of a conflict of rights, nobody really knows how on earth to resolve such conflicts. <clears throat> Now, obviously, freedom rights have always been qualified because your freedom can conflict with mine. You, know, uh, you may have the freedom to pursue, <coughs> pursue happiness in your own way, but if your happiness consists in, in cutting up and eating uh, me, uh, then uh, <coughs> I, obviously it's an invasion of my right to give you a full, uh, the full um, agenda. So there's always been the, the thought that rights to, in, in, a, in a free community must be curtailed in order to be available to everyone. John Stuart Mill put this in terms of the principle of harm, that, that uh, we all, we all are, should be at liberty to pursue our own uh, projects in our own way, uh, and no, no state should, should be entit was entitled to coerce us in any way except in order to prevent harm to others. He never described what harm is, but one way of thinking of this is to, is to uh, define harm as interfering in others' rights. In other words, uh, the, a, a liberal community tries to maximise rights uh, over the whole of society by ensuring that everybody has a right to do whatever he does except interfere with the rights of others. Um, but of course, in a modern community, there are all kinds of ways of interfering with, the, with others which are quite difficult to express in terms of rights. If you buy uh, um, a little piece of land in the middle of the Princeton campus and build upon it a 30-storey building, you know, um, most people would say that is intolerable. The ruining is beautiful and uh, harmonious and... and uh, you know, traditional precinct with with a with an eyesore, and most people want, would want there to be rules that stop that. But it, it's not clear that we're harmed by uh, an object like that, except in a very very vague sense of harm. But it's certainly something that we uh, we deeply resent. Okay, uh, so this already these this principle of Mills already gives the state a large say in what can be allowed and what can't be. It's not, so even negative rights require the state for their administration. But claim rights inflate things even further. I'll just take some recent cases. I might uh, think that I have a right to, to be the sex... I know you say gender here. OK, the gender that I think myself to be. Um, you know, uh, and um, it's, it's an unfair dispensation of fate that, uh, that I have not been able to realise my identity as a woman. Uh, and uh, it, somebody must therefore respond to this. Uh, and the National Health Service in Great Britain responds uh, and spends a, an enormous amount of money on the uh, surgery required to, to uh, reprocess Roger Scruton as a woman uh, and all the um, uh, med medication afterwards. And, um, you know, uh, that, that is, since that was my right, that has to be done. It writes Trump, all the countervailing interests. The countervailing interests, uh, let alone, uh, let's forget the interests of my wife, but the countervailing interests <laughs> of the community, not to spend money on what could proved to be just a, a passing whim of my, on my part, um, it, it is uh, annihilated by the claim of right. So there's, a, uh, there's a one example in which, if, if it becomes the fashion, of course the National Health Service will collapse. I mean, it is sort of collapsing anyway, but this, this would hasten it <laughs> to its end. Uh, uh, again, uh, uh, this is a very important a feature of our uh, of the European problems at the moment, that the, the European Court of Human Rights believes that communities have a right to pursue their traditional lifestyle in the way that they have always enjoyed. Uh, and so, thanks to the 
freedom of movement in the European Union. Irish travellers settle in the English countryside. Uh, and um, in, on green fields where you're not allowed to build. Uh, and um, claim that their traditional lifestyle of moving from place to place requires them to be allowed to settle anywhere. They ha this is a right. The interest of their neighbours in maintaining the value of their properties, um, which is, of course, have been completely destroyed by the gypsy camp next door, is only an interest. It's not a, a right. And the legislation, the, the planning legislation, which is one of the great achievements of post-war Britain, cannot stand against a claim of individual right. So the, the, this legislation, which is a huge, a hugely expensive and on which the country has depended for an uh, equilibrium in many ways for the resolution of these kind of conflicts, is um, a great hole is driven through it. Okay, so there's another bit of rights uh, inflation. Right. Uh, uh, Okay, so uh, you, you know, once you think of these cases, you probably know many more, uh, and they're coming up all the time. Uh, and they're coming with them is the spectre of group rights and compensation rights. The, the, in that gypsy case, the Irish traveller's case, uh, it, it, you, the right that the Irish traveller has to upset uh, the planning regulations, he has by virtue of his membership of a group, not by virtue of his, his being just a human being. So it's being put forward as a human right, even though it's a right which grants privileges to one group over, over the remainder. Is that, can that be so? Aren't human rights supposed to be universal rights and so on? And then, you're, as you're familiar with compensation rights in, in American law, where, where the group to which you belong, because it has been badly treated in the past, confers privileges on you now in order to rectify that bad treatment. Again, uh, the universal idea of uh, the human rights is being eroded. So I would like to say, in uh, response to all this, that whatever we, we think about these conflicts, and they are growing all around us all the time, we, we must maintain the priority of freedom rights. Uh, and I'll just give you my reason for thinking this, and I know this is controversial. I, I mean, that there is a prob the problem arises for two reasons. First of all, there is no decision procedure determining what right is a natural right and what just an invention. You know, the lists of, of the U UN Declaration of Human Rights seems like an arbitrary list. Uh, uh, not arbitrary in the sense that there isn't a reason for each item being there, but there is no process of reasoning which enables you to deduce all of these. Each one has to be deduced by some other, some new consideration, sometimes political, sometimes social, but, uh, but there's no body of, of principles from which it flows. And this absence of a decision procedure means that the whole thing is very precarious, and nobody really knows whether, it's, whether some alleged human right is a human right or what it means to say that it is a human right as opposed to a right conferred by this legislature on this occasion. Uh, and the second problem, as I've already mentioned, is that rights are vetoes, uh, or trumps, as, as Dworkin says. They settle the argument in favour of the party who can claim them. Uh, and so they leave the other going away empty-handed. So in that way, they disrupt the possibility of legislative compromise. In the case I, I gave you of the travellers in the English countryside, the legislation, uh, planning legislation, which they were disrupting, is, is the result of a whole century of compromise, uh, of compromise arguments in the legislature, working out how to, how to balance the many conflicting interests that, uh, that arise in the use of land. And everybody knows that, they, that this is not something that you can solve overnight. It's something that is, gets incorporated into the whole tradition of living together in, the, in, in a particular place. So uh, compromise goes out of the window. And th I think this is an argument for thinking that, that r rights in general should be granted sparingly, and especially these natural, so-called natural rights, uh, and in such a way as to impose no unnatural burden on others. Uh, and I think we, we've seen that rights inflation does mean state inflation because the state has always to be called in in order to, um, to settle the question. 
But nevertheless, we do need to talk in terms of, of rights. And I think we should ask ourselves uh, just why the, the, this talk is necessary to us. Uh, I began by saying that, um, that there is a boundary between you and me that has to be maintained if our relations are to be uh, satisfying to both of us in the sense of, of making us both accountable to each other and also not invasive of each other. But I think there is also a need for a boundary uh, separating the citizen from the state, uh, the boundary behind which the citizen can retreat, from which he can offer his consent or withhold his consent, uh, as we do at election time and so on. And so uh, I think we each need a, a sphere of personal sovereignty where, where we're free from invasion. And that's what the American Declaration of Independence was really saying. A society of ours, like ours, which is a society based on citizenship, is also a society of strangers. It's not a family. It's not a collection of people who believe that they're bound together by some relation of brotherhood. Uh, and I'm going to talk about that uh, uh, on Thursday because uh, in the case of Middle Eastern society, people do want to think of themselves as bound by a relation of brotherhood. We exist in another way. Uh, we, are, we are a society of strangers, each of whom wishes to be valued as an individual and to act as an individual in his relations with others. And that means his sovereignty as an individual must be maintained. There must be some area within which his choice uh, determines what the outcome is. And from that position, that protected position, he can then bargain with others, form relations by agreement, uh, and be, uh, 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 become a, a useful citizen accordingly. And um, that just leads me to my final thoughts, which will bring us to next time. That uh, This rights talk is, for the reason I've just given, extremely useful to us and necessary for us if we are to enjoy free and consensual relations with each other and free and consensual relations with the state. But it doesn't capture all of our duties uh, for many reasons. I'll just very briefly say some of them. The dead have rights, of course, uh, especially your own dead have rights. Your mother said to you on her deathbed that she wanted you to look after her sister uh, and you promised okay, the, the, um, it, you would be violating a right conferred on your mother by not doing that. But our way of dealing with the dead is not really properly captured by this concept of a right. We, we have duties to them that transcend anything they have a right to. Duties uh, of piety, as I, as I put it last time. Duties to maintain in being the, be the bequest that they have passed on to us. Maintain it uh, and, if possible, enhance it. Uh, we can't simply squander everything they've done all, uh, and make light of all their sacrifices. But, of course, they, they don't have rights uh, to affirm these things, and they can't, can't uh, affirm their rights in a court of law. They are absent forever. And there's the same problem with the unborn, and that's an even greater problem, which I'm going to talk about on Thursday, because it... It relates to the whole condition in which we now find ourselves uh, facing a future in which we've um, run up debt that we ourselves are incapable of, uh, of honouring. Then we have duties to the earth, to animals, to nature, to God. All these mean that we must move on from the sphere of rights to take in another and more comprehensive vision of our relation to the world. Just to, uh, in the case of animals, there are people who think that animals have rights. But animals cannot participate in this calculus of rights and duties that I've been discussing. So there must be another ground, in my view at least, for our duties towards them. And that's what I want to try and discover next time. There I shall leave it because uh, uh, apparently we must have a discussion now. Uh, um, which, which has to last till six o'clock, otherwise uh, you'll get short shrift and could be complaining that your rights have been <laughs> abused. <laughs>
you know, be students at Princeton. No student questions. Okay. Uh, let's open it up then. Professor Anderson, and you're next. I, I think in the uh, Declaration of Independence, there's a phrase that says, in the Declaration of Independence, there's a phrase that says that these truths are self-evident. Mm. And uh, it seems to me that the problem with explaining rights, uh, freedom rights and claim rights has to do with whether accept them, people accept them as being true or they simply accept them as being an article of faith. So can you go deeper into the, uh, the real foundation, the natural foundation to these rights? Well, that's a very good question, uh, uh, and my answer is no, I can't. Um, uh, because I, I, I think all attempts to get lower than I've got, um, however noble that counts, um, uh, uh, go into areas where there isn't any procedure for settling things. Uh, but I, I prefer to say, look, th if we have this calculus that I've just um, elaborated, then we do have a problem-solving device which uh, w does enable human communities to develop in uh, a spirit of mutual consent. Uh, and that that's in, should be enough. There may be metaphysical or transcendental principles that uh, give a foundation to it. And I, I am tempted by Kant's view that, um, uh, that you, we must treat uh, humanity or ration, rational beings as ends in themselves and not as means only, and, and that underlies all this. But again, I, I wonder whether it isn't just a, a shorthand for what I've been saying anyway. In the beginning of your discussion, you were de defining rights at, or morality, I mean, as not transcendent but imminent mm. in certain relationships, including to ourself. And I wondered, um, you spoke about those relationships merely on a human level. Is there a reason you wouldn't also include our relationship to God and duties we have towards God um, that could be described as imminent then? You wouldn't have to refer to mm. them as transcendent, but they would have some of the same um, obligations we have to other humans to act towards our creator? Well, I did mention at the very end that, that, um, that there is, you know, that we have duties to God, that, uh, but I don't think that our, um, I don't think that the common law or our ordinary moral reasoning has ever had to assume that God exists. You know, I think it, I think it, uh, it operates perfectly well without that hypothesis uh, and is still binding on us. Uh, and I, you know, I, th I, I think that um, the people who don't believe in God and don't have any sense that, that there is a duty towards him, nevertheless find themselves bound in this web uh, and, uh, and obliged to, to operate according to its constraints. So I think that, uh, of course, it, there is a, a real question about where our relation with God fits into all this. And one answer would be that through learning the I to you relation, as we do at our mother's breast, you know, uh, through learning that, we also obtain the, the uh, ability to project that relation much, much beyond the human community to the world as such and to the creator of the world. Uh, and so growing out of our ITU encounters is a certain spiritual hunger for the ultimate encounter with the, with the thing that's responsible for it all. And I think that is probably true, and that would explain why it is that religious belief survives all the attempts to, to scatter it. At the top, Professor Signal. Following that up, actually, um, I think uh, there's another way. Another way of giving a religious justification uh, was outlined by Locke, and I think you were quite unfair to him by sort of dismissing his discussion of of, of the foundation for rights. 
uh, because chapter two of the of of, of the uh, uh, of the second treatise, in fact, outlines <laughs> as the basis for our rights that we were created by God, and God would not. God creates us with the intention of obliging us to continue ourselves in existence, um, and 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 also creates us with a with a, with a, a free will in which in which we can exercise and in, mm. in uh, uh, creating uh, other structures, and then later he he also develops the defense of property in a similar way. Uh, that property is not only mixing your labor, that's his famous thing, but property is also a way of carrying out God's, uh, uh, the duty, our duty to God to preserve ourselves more effectively, that private property is a better way of mm. preserving ourselves. So, and of course, this is reflected in the Declaration of Independence, which you talk a lot about, but uh, you've dismissed Locke, but don't dismiss the Declaration of Independence, and there, of course, it's uh, endowed by their creator. These are God-given rights. Right. So there are, you know, ways mm. other than the one you've just given, uh, and one of them is a way that was quite important uh, because it was developed by Locke and who, who in turn inspired the, the Declaration of Independence. Yes, well, uh, I feel duly rebuked, um, <laughs> but, but I, I maintain my view that Locke didn't have a very profound view of human nature. Uh, and that is proved to me by the fact that he makes these rights depend upon God having given them to us rather than extracting them from a conception of what kind of thing we really are, which is what I'm trying to do. But I agree, I was unfair to look. Um, and uh, there we are. <laughs> he was my fellow countryman, though, so I can, I'm entitled. <laughs> I'd like to go out, uh, go at the same sort of thing from the other side. You mentioned that you don't assume uh, God. And let me ask then, um, if the dead are really dead and uh, we don't assume that they're floating around somewhere watching us and benefiting by our actions, then I'm having a problem with number the second point up there with the dead having rights and uh, are having duties to them. How can anything that doesn't exist have a right and how can we have a duty to something that doesn't exist? To me, it makes sense if it's a poetic way of saying we act this way because it's of benefit to those who are still living, uh, knowing, making us feel better and making us comforted. Mm. But if you mean literally that the dead have rights and we have duties to them, I, I don't understand that at all. I'd like you to clarify that, please. Well, I, I agree this is a, a, a major area which I, I, I will come back to next time. But um, just briefly, what what I think is that we do make promises to the dead, and a promise isn't the undertaking of an obligation. So whatever we think about where the dead are or whether they are, we do have obligations to them. And that's another way of saying that they have rights against us. They have the right to, for that, to that, that that obligation should be fulfilled. Uh, and, um, and people who promise things to the dead and then don't fulfill their promises, and not just uh, harming themselves through, through living uh, with an un, uh, in an inauthentic way, but they are, in some sense, harming the, the, the person to whom they gave that promise, because all of us have interests in what happens after we're dead. I have interests in what happens to my children after, my, uh, after I'm dead, and uh, I might ask my friend to look after them, um, uh, and uh, because, and he would do so because he he wants to do that which is in my interest, and he makes a promise. That's so. Although I then die, it's still that promise and everything is part of this web of rights and duties that survives me. But of course, I, I agree with you that that if the dead really are dead and gone, there is a question about what else we owe them, if we haven't made them any particular promises and what our duties to them might be. But I, I suspect that um, if, you, if the trustees of Princeton University bulldoze this campus tomorrow, many people would say you know, that they had a duty to or the people who had built this and all those students who had passed through it and the great dead of Princeton not to do that. 
uh, as we have a duty not to plough up the battlefields of Flanders, you know, where, where our dead and be are buried, and to maintain the monuments to them. So I think that we, we have this sense of duty, and if we, did, if we lost it, we'd lose one of the most important connections we have, which is the connection with, the, with people who went before us and passed on to us what they had achieved. Um, I, I would just like to add something to what you, what you just said, Professor Scruton, that, that may support your argument, and that is that we do, um, we do quite routinely and traditionally honor the rights of the dead in probating last wills and testaments. If, if, the, de if the dead haven't any rights, then the, the entire exercise of honoring someone's last wishes as expressed in a written instrument, disposing of property and so on, is uh, 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 sort of uh, defrauding ourselves or, or, or fooling ourselves in some sense. Would you agree with that? Yes, I think that's right. I, th I think that, again, I, I, say, I will come back to this next time. I think it is very, uh, the gentleman touched on a really important issue, which is how you weave absent generations into your present decision-making in such a way uh, as to acknowledge the bond between you. Uh, and not to acknowledge that bond is to jeopardize not just them, but also you. So, uh. Professor K. Tab, and then we'll come over here. All right. Uh, I'd like to return to the question the gentleman before the last one asked you. I, I don't see that you would lose anything by, by rewriting a little bit uh, points one and two. So it would go like this. Wright's talk does not capture all of our duties, period. Mm. Fine. Then you eliminate the next words and, until you reach our duties. No. What? Can we carry on, I think? Uh, Wright's talk does not capture all our duties. Um, our duties to the dead transcend anything they have a right to, period. Yeah. And eliminate all the other words in the first two points. And then the third point, likewise for the unborn, well, I don't think you should say likewise for this reason. The dead are gone. Whereas the unborn generations, say two, three, four, five, six generations from now, the unborn, I think should be envisaged as potential persons to whom we have obligations, even though they can't claim them. Whereas the dead are no longer potential persons, mm. they're gone. So I would drop the word likewise and say, as for the unborn, comma, you would then proceed with your right. argument. Phew, okay, I shall, I shall correct this slide uh, in the manner you've recommended. But I, I would say that there is this appalling American prejudice in favor of the future, which, uh, which I don't share. You know, uh, I, I think absent generations are absent, whether, wherever they are in time. But I agree, that there is, uh, as I say, I, this was really just a preview of what I'm going to work out we're somewhat better next time, I hope. Uh, in your discussion of the uh, distinction between uh, claim rights and uh, uh, natural, in discussion of you know the fact that we don't, there's no decision system yeah. for natural rights. There's no way to outline or actually agree upon what are natural rights. I know you did kind of dismiss uh, God-given rights, but do you think? our lack of a decision system arrives from the fa uh, arises from the fact that we believe our rights are God-given, that we want to almost demand them from the creator, that, that we are asking for rights and now we're condescending to demand them from government, from the state. This is a, 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 another huge issue that, of course, if you, one way of, of acquiring a decision procedure is to say that, that we, inquire as to which rights God gave us. Then we have to know how he gave them to us and uh, wh where is the revelation. And I'm going to talk next time a bit about, about uh, law 
derived from revelation, which tends not to take the form of rights, but the form of duties, you know, that, like the Sharia uh, uh, of the Muslims. And I think uh, that there's a, a large conflict growing in the world today because uh, many people think that the only valid form of law is one that is, to, is revealed fr from God's, uh, through God's prophet or whatever. And I think that, in a way, having recourse to, to revelation is another way of saying that we haven't got a decision procedure and we're going to tell, we're just going to say that what occurs to us is, is right. You know, what, we're, what one is looking for is a decision procedure like that of the court of law, which tells us, which actually determines what our rights are. Perhaps, perhaps you're going to talk about this on Thursday, but I wanted to refer to your first lecture and this summary here. Mm. Uh, I'm a little surprised up to now you haven't said anything about international law or international relations. Uh, on Thursday, you, or on Monday, you said that um, your understanding in the realm of the moral calculus, we become free in something that approximates the Hegelian dialectic. Uh, power relations are replaced by moral relations. And my recollection of uh, Hegel's treatment of this matter in philosophy of right is that the international arena is one place where moral relations are essentially precluded. And I look at your list here of rights and duties at the end, and you don't say anything about duties that human beings might have to human beings in other states. Mm. Uh, for example, raising the question whether in a democracy people might have a duty to protest if uh, their government is uh, fighting a war of aggression against other, another state. Um, yeah. And you made the reference at the beginning today to, um, to Grotius, um, uh, the principle in international law that uh, agreements are to be honored. So I was just a bit surprised you haven't thus yeah. far said anything about this. No, I share your surprise. Um, in, that, in that I fully intended to mention, among the things not covered, the international dimension, uh, where, where the, the ITU encounter has been transcended in, in another way. But, uh, and I agree with you, I, I must address it next time. Uh, of course, the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights was intended as a foundation for international law as well, uh, in, as I say, as a kind of uh, limitation on what states can do to their own citizens. Uh, and um, the kind of inflation into all these lists of claims, largely under Eleanor Roosevelt's influence, of course, um, meant that it, it couldn't be any more interpreted as limiting the powers of those other states, but of exhorting them to increase, but in a different direction from the way they were increasing. And so um, and I think it's a lot of the problems in international law have ar arisen from that. But I, I would like to talk about that next time, if there's time. Roger, can I uh, mm. ask a question about uh, Thomas Hobbes, oh. someone who right. wouldn't have much sympathy for international uh, legal <coughs> theories, but has a very um, uh, strong uh, 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 natural rights philosophy and doesn't rely on uh, the divine to uh, as any way of deriving those rights but simply works with human nature, human passions, the human situation. Would, what would be your objection to that as a um, method of decision in trying to decide what, what are the natural rights? Is it because he has as thin a notion of human nature as, as Locke? Is that mm. it? Right. Um, <clears throat> well, I don't only share a nationality with, with Hobbes. I, I share a, a town. I live in Malmesbury. So I am, uh, that gives me uh, the, the right to say uh, of Thomas Hobbes that his philosophy of human nature is even thinner than Locke's. <laughs> Um, and, of course, he does have that famous section in the, in the Leviathan where he lays out the natural law, but he makes it very clear that, it, that the, 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 it, what he's doing there is simply talking about an, uh, 
something that we could never apply in our own affair in regulating our own affairs anyway. So I, I, I'd okay. I'm not a Hobbes scholar, I, uh, but um, I, I suspect you know I, I, as you as I revealed yesterday, my thinking really comes out of German uh, post-Kantian philosophy rather than English empiricism. Professor Stone. A question about the common law and your use of common law. Uh, your distinction between freedom rights and claim rights, I can understand from the point of view of a natural rights theory, but not from a point of view of common law. I would have thought in common law these kinds of rights are interwoven with one another so mm -hmm. that you have a right to your inheritance, right? And is that a claim? That's not a freedom right. That's a claim right, yeah. I would say. And, uh, uh, and, and then I would imagine a right to all sorts of things in, in that whole complex of institutions of civil society that the common law sustains and articulates. So I, 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 uh, it's not clear to me that you can have it both ways, the distinction mm. between freedom rights and claim rights, and then the praise of the common law that works out in the context of society uh, the full array of, uh, of uh, actual rights. Yeah. I think that's a, a very good observation. What I meant to say was that in the context of natural rights theory, claim rights are an intrusion, freedom rights not. Uh, they're an intrusion because a claim always presupposes a history. Uh, in, in the case that I took, Mr. Mr. Fletcher, I think it is, has a claim against Mr. Rylands for compensation to the extent, such and such an extent. Uh, and in granting claims, the, the, common, the common law is always relating a person to what he has, himself has done, uh, you know, uh, uh, and what the other has done to him, what he's done or what he's suffered. Uh, and so it's part of the ongoing history of human conflict. And this doesn't have this status of standing outside all human conflicts and laying down universal principles. So for that reason, uh, there isn't any problem of introducing claims into the uh, claim rights into the rights adjudicated in the law. I'd just like to go back to the very beginning of your talk to clarify a couple of uh, phrases you used. You mentioned that you navigate the IU boundary by means of what you called calculus of rights and duties and that there were three a priori principles involved, reciprocity, equality, and honoring agreements. Mm. And my question, really two parts, by use of the term calculus, you seem to be implying that this is something we can rationally figure out to which there is a right answer. So mm. that's my first question, is that a correct interpretation of what you mean? And then my second question is, what exactly do you mean by these principles are a priori? Is this supposed to be synthetic a priori, that these are things we're gonna figure out? Is this a priori in the sense of we take them just to be self-evident, period, no argument mm. needed? Or a priori in the sense that they're just axiomatic, we just choose them because it helps us work out uh, to get to where we want to go? Yeah, that's a very intelligent question. Um, what, what, what I would say, uh, well, first of all, in referring to this as a calculus, I don't mean that it, that it produces one and only one answer necessarily to any particular problem fed into it, but that rather that we all of us can use it in such a way as to resolve our disputes and come to agreements. Uh, and I think children begin their life in the playground already <clears throat> half possessed of this. You know, he did it, no, she did it. Uh, um, they did it together, those sort of things. The imputation argument is already there. Uh, and you know, it was his patch at the playground. She shouldn't have been there. Uh, and so that, that these, if people agree to that, then you've got a, dis, a way of resolving the dispute by using these ideas, imputation, uh, right, uh, and um, claim, and so on. So that's all that I meant to say. It, it then is a, a work of philosophy and jurisprudence to see whether you can extract from this something which actually delivers uh, an, uh, an answer which is received by all reasonable people as just. That's what Mr. Justice Blackburn, Blackburn thought he was doing in the Rylands and Fletcher case. 
as for the three principles, I don't think those are the only principles involved. I've picked those out for consideration because they, they jump out at you as things that we, we're always assuming. And I want to say they're a priori in something like Kant's sense, that they are presupposed in the practice of, of this I to you dialogue. If you didn't presuppose those things, you wouldn't be able to engage in it. Uh, and I think children very quickly come to see that too. Any other questions? Yeah, sure. We still have a few minutes. Uh, Owen, uh, give the mic. Can I talk loud? No. I was curious about uh, your system, your moral system, in that you talk much about duties and obligations. In your system, is there room for the idea of the good? And if so, what is good, according to this moral system? Oh, yes. Um, I, 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 I'm only talking about one half of morality at most, with that which is the, the bit that's involved in our, our human rela relations of accountability, if you like. Um, there is, of course, the general question of the pursuit of the good uh, and the things that we value uh, and what room we make in our life for those things. And that, uh, it, that is independent. That's not going to be settled by this. This is, uh, uh, this is, I'm talking about the machinery for the resolution of human conflict, not, not what human beings should ultimately be aiming at. Uh, and uh, that is a, another very deep question, obviously. What would rise, though? Relative, relative to the good, then, in, in the sense that what different sen different beliefs about what is good would produce different kinds of rights. Possibly, but I, I would like this kind of common law conception of rights, which I've been unfolding, to be uh, as neutral as possible uh, uh, regarding the good. I mean, that is obviously a, an ambition that I share with with John Rawls. Uh, and, if, and other thinkers like that. We live in societies where we recognize that people do have different ideals. Uh, uh, most people, I agree, are wrong, but still you've got to accept that, they're, <laughs> that they have these ideals and you still need this calculus with which to negotiate the boundary. In fact, the boundary between you and them becomes much more important when you despise everything they believe in. Thank you. This is a question about your distinction between uh, society of strangers and society of brothers mm. or brotherhood. Um, um, you, you pointed to, let's say, um, Islamic societies as societies that are construed around concepts of brotherhood mm. and seem to draw a distinction between maybe a certain tension between those two archetypes. But we as members of a family do accord differences to, to members of our family. And even though I belong to a society of strangers, um, you know, I'm aware of concepts such as the family of nations and, and a certain kinship between myself and creatures that have reason. So even if I were to meet, meet an alien, mm. you know, he would, certain, I would certainly recognize a certain kinship between them. So I'm just wondering if they're exclusive or not. No, I think, well, obviously, uh, that, it was shorthand for a lot of other things, what I said. The family is um, a particular form of human community which is distinct from civil society. Hegel makes a very good, um, mounts a very good case for saying that they, they are mutually dependent, that the family is, is required to develop the free individual, but once he's developed, he leaves it and forms associations of his own through civil society and the, and the dialectical tension between those two things is part of what makes uh, the world go round. And I think that is true. And there are, of course, ways in which the family idea can be broadened and made into something more comprehensive. Um, but I think there is a danger of making the brotherhood into the, 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 the single form of, of pre-political unity a danger of actually eclipsing the idea of citizenship and the idea that you can be totally strange to each other. So strange as not to share a faith, not to share ideals and so on. And I, and I think we're seeing that played out 
in Egypt at the moment. Time for one more. Anyone? Yes, right back here. But then, uh, does an answer in, to follow up? Does this? Uh, does the family inherently contradict the IU boundary you were talking about? I mean, if that, if you can expand that boundary beyond, you know, to mm. society in general, doesn't the society, you know, a, a family society, from what I know of, of Islamic, you know, respect with respect to the family, Islamic society, you know, regards the rights and duties of a family, you know, you, you have rights and duties for each other, you form one unity. Doesn't that contradict the IU boundary you've heard to? No, the boundary is there when, uh, whenever people regard each other as accountable to each other in any way whatsoever. Uh, you know, however tightly knit your family, uh, if, your, um, if, if your father beats you unjustly for no reason, you will protest and say you have no reason to do that, uh, etc. You will defend yourself against him. Uh, people in families, however close they are, they argue about who has the privilege to do this and who has the privilege to do that. And they resolve their conflicts in the same way. But of course, uh, they, they have available to them another resource, which is love, which we don't have in our relation to our fellow citizens. Uh, so um, at a certain stage they might say, oh, okay, let's forget about rights and duties, let's just remember that we are together. But um, they're only together still as separate beings. Well, uh, before we thank Professor Scruton, uh, let me just mention that tomorrow he has off, he gets to rest. We've worked him pretty hard in the last few days. Uh, but tomorrow... Uh, uh, life goes on at Princeton, and there's a big lecture in uh, Makash 50 at 4.30. Uh, Chen Wangsheng, the very famous Chinese dissident uh, who's now living in the United States, will be on campus uh, to talk about uh, human rights, the next human rights revolution in uh, China. So I hope you'll join us for that. And now please join me in thanking Roger Scruton.